mad as the hatter october 2007 it was a autumn day in gotham city and in the halls of wayne enterprises a certain short gifted man comes in he was somewhat bald already had a very red complexion to him and he was a great genius his name was jervis tetch and he was coming in like he does every morning and he greets the one woman he's madly in love with a woman named elaine she was your typical young secretary blonde beautiful every guy was chasing after her including tetch but she had a boyfriend already something tetch knew about but he was hopeful and he always tries to charm her when he sees her every morning he says to her good morning elaine you're looking very beautiful this morning Elaine says, oh, thank you, Jervis. You're such a nice guy. How are you this morning? She asked Jervis back. Jervis says, oh, I'm feeling so wonderful. And now that I see you, I'm feeling even more wonderful, he says to her. She giggles back at Jervis and she says, oh, you. And then she says to Jervis, good luck with the inspection today with Mr. Wayne, she says. Then Jervis says, oh, my, I forgot. Mr. Wayne is coming through here for an inspection today. No wonder why Stickley was on a tight ship this week. He says to Elaine. Then he says, good day, Elaine. And he goes into the R&D department. The R&D department was just massive, full of scientists working at their workstations, just developing everything they can for Wayne Enterprises. Jervis Tetch reaches his workstation. His workstation was a mess. It had a lot of stuff scattered around it. Of course, like many of the workstations, it had personal decorations, namely posters from heavy metal bands, posters of Alice in Wonderland, and a sketch of Alice, a few little statuettes, one of a mushroom, the other one of the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland, and just a huge collection of sketches hanging about. These sketches range from diagrams for a circuit board to diagrams of the human brain and brainwave patterns. There was also a stack of books on the human mind. Also, there was a small cage for his lab rats. And also, completing his workstation was your typical high-end workstation computer and a laptop for his personal use along with a cluttered mess of electronic stuff like chips, resistors, capacitors, and printed circuit boards. Then he greets his lab rats and he says, good morning fellas, you ready to do another round of testing? There was a bizarre thing on the heads of the lab rats. It looked like a little chip that was on top of their scalp. Then Jervis reaches for a high-tech looking headband and he puts on the headband and then he says, all right, fellas, let's see how we perform today. Then with his headband, he began concentrating on the lab rats. The chip on the lab rats scalp allowed Touch to control them like puppets and he was pretty much making them move certain little objects around in the cage and everything. Then after he was done, he takes off the headband and he says, Excellent work, fellas. We're improving greatly, he says. Then the moment came. Stickley comes into the department with Bruce Wayne and Lucius Fox. And they go over to the individual workstations and talk with the scientists and engineering in each of those workstations. Jervis prepares himself as he says to himself in a loud but soft whisper, Okay, okay, Tetch, okay, all right? He's just an ordinary guy. Yes, he is your boss, but he's just an ordinary man. Act cool, act cool. Well, finally, the three men come up to Tetch's workstation, and Jervis Tetch says, Oh my goodness, Bruce Wayne, it's good to meet you. He shakes 25-year-old Bruce Wayne's hands and was not letting go. Bruce Wayne says, Uh, Mr. Tetch, I'm going to need that hand back. Jervis says, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Wayne. Then Jervis goes on to make a bigger idiot of himself. and It's like, Oh, it's so nice to meet the man, the man who hired me. Well, 
he says, you don't, you didn't hire me personally, but your name was on the hiring slip when I got the job, he says to Bruce Wayne. Uh, then Bruce Wayne says, okay, Mr. Tetch, so what are you working on here? He asks the 27-year-old engineer. Then Tetch says, Mr. Wayne, what I'm working on here is the greatest invention of a lifetime, he says to him. And then he goes on to explain, Mr. Wayne, what would you say was one of the greatest inventions of mankind? Bruce was puzzled and he said to Tetch, there are many great inventions that mankind has come up with over the years says Bruce Wayne. Then Tetch says, well, there's one exactly that stands out. And then he says, it's the computer, Mr. Wayne. The computer is mankind's greatest invention, says Tetch, since the splitting of the atom. Then he goes on to explain to the men, now, Mr. Wayne, Mr. Stickley, Mr. Fox, I have figured out something very fantastic, he says. Then he goes on to explain, now, gentlemen, the human brain is just like a computer, but unlike the computers that we all use in our day-to-day -day lives, it's a lot more complex than that. But just like any computer, he says, it can be reprogrammed, told what to do. Then he goes on to grab his high-tech headband and puts it on, and he says, gentlemen, observe these rats. These rats are just your run-of-the-mill lab rats. Well, thanks to my theories, I was able to control them with a special microchip that you see placed on their scalp. Then... Jervis Touch demonstrates his invention, and the lab rats do what he commanded them via thought to do. The three men were amazed, and Jervis smiles, and he takes off the headband, and he says, See, gentlemen, this is just the first step. And then he goes on to explain to Bruce Wayne, Now, Mr. Wayne, I need a little more funding so we can go to the next level, to human trials. Bruce Wayne gives Jervis Tetch a look, and he says, I'm sorry, Mr. Tetch, I can't agree to something like this. Jervis was like, what? What, what? what do you mean you can't agree to something like this? This is a major breakthrough. Imagine, Mr. Wayne, with this device, we could reprogram criminals to behave. And Bruce Wayne says, no, I cannot agree to something that's going to violate the free will of people, he says. Then Jervis is like, no, Mr. Wayne, you can't do this, Mr. Wayne. And then Stickley says, he has just done it. I officially terminate your project, he says, and we will talk about this later. And then he says, come on, Mr. Wayne, we have more to see. And the three men walk off. Heartbroken and crushed, Jervis Touch says, you were supposed to say yes, Mr. Wayne. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Afterwards, Touch goes to the employee lounge. He thought he was the only one in there, but he heard a little whimper, a little cry. He goes to look, and it was Elaine. Elaine was crying, and he says, Elaine, what's going on? Elaine says, it's my boyfriend. We had a big argument, and, and he left me. He called me a horrible name and left me. Then Jervis asks her, what, did he do that here? Then Elaine says, no, I called him to ask him something, and then that's when it all started. Oh, oh, I feel so terrible, she says. Then Jervis says to her, it's okay, Elaine. If your idiot ex was too blind to see the woman that he had, then he doesn't deserve you. Then Elaine wipes a tear from her eyes and lets out a slight smile, and Jervis lets out a slight smile, and he says, Elaine, I have an idea. Both of us are having a bad day. That jerk just broke your heart, and my special project was shot down. Let's me and you go out in the town tonight. Sky's the limit. Elaine was like, oh, I, I can't. I have a lot of things to do. Jerry says, nonsense. You have nothing to do. And he says to her, please, Elaine, let's just go out tonight and just forget about our problems. She says, okay, Tetch, what time do you want me to be ready? Tetch says to her, seven o'clock. Well... That night, Jervis Touch took Elaine out on the town, and it was the most romantic evening that she's ever had, and it seemed that love was in the air, or so he thought. He drops Elaine off at the brownstone that she lived at, and he drove off. Elaine goes into the building, and there, in the entrance, was waiting her 
what she thought was going to be her ex-boyfriend. And her ex-boyfriend says, Elaine, we have to talk. Well, the next morning at Wayne Enterprises, Jervis comes into the office with a big smile on his face. And he was carrying a dozen red roses. As he was coming up to Elaine's desk, Elaine had a bright smile on her face, and she says to Jervis, Oh, thank you, Jervis, for last night. That was the best night I had, and you won't believe what happened, she says. Jervis says, What? What happened? Brian. Brian was at my apartment waiting for me, she says, when I got home. And we patched things up, and he asked me to marry him, and I said yes. And she shows Jervis the engagement ring. Jervis angrily squeezes the bouquet of roses. There were still some thorns in them, and he began to bleed a little, and that blood dripped onto Elaine's desk. And she says, oh my, Jervis, you're, you're bleeding. Jervis says, yes, I'm bleeding, and that's it. No, I, I'm, I'm good, he says. He throws the roses in the garbage can that's next to Elaine's desk and goes into the R&D department. Well, nighttime had fallen. And Stickley comes in to inspect the place before he went home to see if there was any of the employees that were still there working late night. And he noticed just one that was working. It was Tetch. Tetch was hard at work and Stickley comes up and he asks, Mr. Tetch, what are you doing? And Tetch says back to Stickley, why I'm beginning the next phase of my project. Stickley says... Mr. Tetch, you were told that your project was terminated. And Tetch says, yes, but I am having problem hearing you because you are an asshole, said Tetch. Stick was like, well, okay, Mr. Tetch, if you want to be that way, you are fired. And Tetch says, oh, no, Mr. Stickley, please don't fire me. With a big tone of sarcasm in his voice. Then Stickley says, I will call security to escort you out of here. Then Stickley turns around to go to the secretary's desk to call security, but that was his mistake. As he did that, then Tetch grabs his coffee pot and smashes it over Stickley's head. And Tetch says loud, Caffeine will kill ya! Then... Stickley regains consciousness. He was tied to an office chair and he had some sort of contraption on his head and he sees Tetch there too sitting in another office chair across from him with a identical looking contraption on his head and both contraptions were wired to some sort of machinery on a small table in the center between them. And Touch says to Stickley, well, Mr. Stickley, it's time to begin the next phase, and I'm very glad you'd volunteered to be my guinea pig. Stickley says, Touch, you let go of me now, or else you're going you're gonna to be in trouble with the law. I will tell the police. Then Touch says, oh, I'm scared. Don't worry, Stickley, he says. You're not going to feel a thing. This machine here is called a Wayfinder, and it's going to find a way into your brain and find the frequency for me to start getting into the human mind, said Tetch. Then Stick was like, you're, you're mad. You're a madman, Tetch. Oh, oh, don't you dare touch that button. Then Tetch said, what, this button? Then Tetch presses the button, and Stickley feels the machine probing his mind as the computer display screen shows the wave machine looking for the frequency to get into the human mind. Then Stickley was in a trance-like state, and Tetch says, Stickley, do you obey me? Then Stickley says, yes, I do. I will do what you command. Tetch lets out a big smile, and he says, excellent. Then he grabs a pen and paper, and he says, Stickley, tell me your bank code and every password to all your important files regarding your finances. Then Stickley replies and tells Tetch all his passwords and bank codes. Then afterwards, 
Tetch turns off the machine and Stickly snaps out of it and he says, All right, Tetch, all right, you're in deep trouble now, mister. When I get out of here, you'll be sorry. Then Tetch says, Oh no, Stickly, no, no, no. You're the one in trouble now. Thanks to you, I now have what I need. Then Tetch grabs the chair that Stickly was tied to and begins pushing it towards a giant window at the end of the room. Stickly began screaming, Tetch, don't do something you're going to regret. As Tetch was pushing the chair faster, he gives a mighty shove and the chair crashes right through the giant window. But Stickly didn't fall to his death. He still had the helmet contraption on that was still connected to the machinery by that giant cable. And Tetch quickly runs over to the dangling Stickly. And he says to Stickly, Well, it was sure nice knowing you, you big jerk. And when you get to hell, tell them I sent you. Stickly screams, Tetch, you're, you're mad! Then Tetch says, Yes, you're right. I'm mad as a hatter. <laughs> then he reaches for the helmet contraption and pulls the strap that was holding it to Stickly's head, and Stickly falls to his death. Then the Mad Hatter goes over to the security camera, and then he blocks it. The next morning, the police were there at Wayne Enterprises, and with the police was Detective Rene Montoya, who was investigating the robbery. And there was also Bruce Wayne and Lucius Fox, and all three of them were looking at the display screen on the security desk of the robbery of the night before. And they see that several men wearing ski masks and armed with guns come inside the building. And then they see the scene where they had Stickly tied to the office chair, and they kicked him out the window. And then Renee Montoya says to Bruce Wayne, Well, Mr. Wayne, it seems that Stickly knew these men because according to the security data here it seems like at 9 p.m. Stickly let them into the building and they did a good clean out job they cleaned out a lot from the R&D department and then Montoya gives Wayne a list of the stuff that was stolen Wayne had just looked down the list quickly he didn't read into detail but one thing did stick out to him all the stuff that Tetch was working on was also stolen, which worried him in the back of his mind. And then he says, well, thank you, Detective Montoya. And he shook her hand and he says, I just can't believe Tetch did that. And then Detective Montoya says, and Mr. Wayne, you won't believe this, but after they killed Stickly, they cleaned out his bank accounts. And we're investigating that because we're finding something strange about his bank account like he was receiving a good chunk of money on the side several thousand dollars a month and bruce wayne says to detective montoya well just keep me informed detective he said and he walks off with lucius and then lucius says to him in a high whisper mr wayne i don't like the look of this stickley was not the man to take bribes or work for a rival company to steal secrets Bruce says, well, it goes to show you, you just can't trust anybody nowadays. I'm as shocked as you. Stickley's worked for the company for over 25 years, and now he's doing this? We paid this man very well, says Bruce. Lucia says, I just don't like the look of this at all. And he goes on to say, this is not the Stickley that I knew. The Stickley that I knew was a dedicated man to this company and would never do such a thing at all. I have to get my hands on that security data. I have a bad feeling about something, said Lucius to Bruce. Bruce says, well, good luck. It's now in police hands, he says. One year later, October 2008. A year has passed since the whole incident took place. It was autumn again. It was cool and crisp outside in Gotham City, New Jersey. And everybody was just enjoying the welcome change and in seasons. Including all the men in the Gotham City Yacht Club. Who were all meeting at the clubhouse in Gotham Harbor. And the men were just all having fun, enjoying drinking, talking. And there among the group was Bruce Wayne, just doing the same thing, drinking and talking. 
Then the festivity was interrupted by a group of men armed with guns who come storming into the club. They were all wearing white rabbit masks and they had everyone at gunpoint. All the club members had their hands in the air. And the leader comes in. He was wearing a stylized Mad Hatter costume with a cheap Mad Hatter Halloween mask. And he says, All right, gentlemen, I'm just here to take the basics. You know, your watch, jewelry, and any money you have on you. Then the Mad Hatter produces a bag, and he says, Okay, gentlemen, don't try anything stupid, and just dump everything in this bag as I come along and try anything funny. Then these men are programmed to shoot, he says. So all the men began dumping their jewelry, watches, and money into the bag. After they were done, then the Mad Hatter says to his men, All right, gentlemen, let's part. And his men began to leave. And then the Mad Hatter says to the members of the Yacht Club, Well, gentlemen, have a fantabulous day. <laughs> and he leaves. Later, at the rebuilt Wayne Manor, Bruce Wayne was telling Alfred and his new Robin, Jason Todd, about the whole incident that happened at the Yacht Club. And Jason Todd says with excitement in his voice, Oh, wow, another costumed criminal man what is with the city and just drawing costume criminals in then alfred says oh my master bruce i'm sure the media is going to blame the batman for this one's creation too bruce says either way i'm sure he's going to strike again it's just a matter of waiting and i think the waiting is not going to be very long said bruce to the other two men Sure enough, the crime wave hit the city as the Mad Hatter and his Alice in Wonderland themed costumed men strike, robbing jewelry store, robbing banks, and robbing any other store they can get to. Of course, Batman and Robin were working hard trying to figure out who the Mad Hatter is as they combed every crime scene he hit, but he has left very little evidence to lead to who he is, and the police were doing no better as the commissioner was angry at the lack of progress on his officers and detectives part. Meanwhile, across the city, in the brownstone apartment of young Elaine, her wedding was coming up in November. She was excited like any young woman who was about to get married. She was coming home late from work as she had stopped by the grocery store to get some groceries. As she gets into her apartment, she hears a telephone ring. <coughs> Elaine quickly drops her groceries and runs to the phone to get it. It was Brian, and he began to say to her, Elaine, listen, it's Brian. I can no longer be with you anymore. I don't love you. I made a terrible mistake. The engagement is off. Goodbye. Elaine was devastated, and she began to cry. Meanwhile, back at the apartment of Brian, he was there. He had a hat on. He was in a trance-like state. It was none other than the work of the Mad Hatter, who was right next to him, smiling demonically. The next morning, the saddened Elaine goes to her job. As she leaves the brownstone and begins walking down the sidewalk, preparing to do her morning routine of taking the subway to work, all of a sudden, a van pulls right up beside her, and the doors fly open, and several men in rabbit masks come out and put a sack over her and quickly take her into the van and speed off. <laughs> That night, Batman and Robin were on a nearby rooftop when they hear the police scanner go off about a robbery at a jewelry store on 14th Street. Well, the dynamic duel make it there. The alarm was still sounding. The display window was broken. The two go inside, but there was no sign of a robbery that occurred. And Robin turned to Batman and says... Maybe they ran off when the alarm sounded. And Batman says to Robin, They probably did. The two crime fighters 
leave the way they came in, and as they went back outside to the sidewalk, suddenly they saw a bunch of armed men in white rabbit masks, and those men began to dance and sing an invitation to Batman and Robin. After they were done singing their invitation, suddenly the mask that they were wearing electrocuted them to death. Then Batman and Robin can hear through the communication system in their ears that the Mad Hatter hacked into, and he extended his invitation. He says, Good evening, Batman and Robin. My name is the Mad Hatter. Businessman, inventor, entrepreneur, and haberdasher. And I cordially invite you to my wedding tonight, as me and Alice are finally tying the knot, he says. And then he goes on to say, If you decide to come, my address is 414 Spring Avenue. And there you will find the entryway to Wonderland. I do hope you come, says Mad Hatter. There's going to be so much fun in games... Someone's surely bound to lose their head. <laughs> then the communication cuts out. Robin looks at Batman, and Batman nods his head yes. Later on, they reach the Mad Hatter's hat shop. They come right in through the front door. It was unlocked. It looked like any hat store. A bunch of hats of all shapes and designs. And empty, since the shop was closed. They walk around, and they make their way to the back of the store. There, there was a small living area that was nicely decorated with expensive furniture and objects. And Robin says to Batman, So, how did we get to Wonderland? After Robin asks that question aloud, suddenly the floor in the center of the living area starts to lower, forming a stairwell. And Batman says to Robin, Well, here's our invitation. So the dynamic duo descend down the stairs, and they end up in Wonderland. It looked like the basement of the building was converted into a giant mock-up of Wonderland. It looked like that Tetch was at work for a very long while building this place up. They were at the entryway of what looked like a forest full of plastic trees of different colors, Artificial lighting to give it the illusion of sunlight coming through the trees and the sounds of birds singing. And Mad Hatter's voice comes overhead saying, Welcome to the forest, Batman and Robin. Do be careful as you cross this forest. I have gotten report that there are bandits loose here. They're attacking wayward travelers. Batman and Robin make their way through the artificial forest, and sure enough, they were ambushed by men wearing pig masks. But the dynamic duo made short work of those men. As they made their way through the forest, the dynamic duo were now at the entryway of Wonderland. And sure enough, there was two men dressed as a dormouse that came to attack them, but they also made short work of them. And so they made their way through the corridors. And, of course, they were ambushed by men dressed as toy soldiers. But it was there after Batman defeated one of them that he noticed the hat that fell off one of those men had some bizarre ring around inside of it. Batman picks up the hat, pulls out the ring. He's seen it before, and he quickly remembered it, and he says aloud, Touch. Robin looks at Batman puzzled, and Batman explained to Robin everything about Jervis Tetch. They finally exited the halls and made it to a open area, and there was a giant chessboard. And the Mad Hatter says overhead, Well, Batman, you made it this far. It surprises me, but let's see if you can win the game of chess, he says. And he goes on to explain to the dynamic duo, Before you is a chessboard. Run the mill? Yes. Dangerous? Yes. And Mad Hatter says, one of these colors is the safe color, and one of these other colors is the death color. You step on the wrong one, and both of you are liable to have a very bad day. See you soon if you make it. Then the two activate their detective mode, and they were able to see quickly which ones were the safe ones to step on and which ones were not. 
and the black squares were the safe squares while the white squares were the booby trap squares each booby trap was different they ranged from electrified flooring to bottomless pits as soon as batman and robin made it to the halfway point of the chessboard suddenly they were attacked by men dressed as pawns they made short work of them of course and finally they made it to a giant dining area there Sitting at the head of the table was the Mad Hatter, and Batman recognized him definitely. It was Jervis Tetch. Then he recognized the woman that was Alice. It was none other than Elaine. And there were other people in costume there. One guy dressed as a walrus, the other one dressed as a chasseur cat, and the other one dressed as a caterpillar. And the Mad Hatter says to the dynamic duo, Welcome, you two. I'm glad you can make it to my wedding. And you made it through my party games. I give you kudos. Then Batman says to Mad Hatter, Release these people from your control, Mad Hatter. They did nothing wrong to you. And Mad Hatter says to Batman, Tis, 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 Batman. If you're going to be unruly at my wedding, I'm going to have to teach you some manners he says, and then he screams the command, Red Queen, off with their heads. Then there was a animatronic of the Red Queen that was coming, screaming, off with their heads, and it was wielding a giant axe. Well, the dynamic duo made short work of the animatronic, and then the Mad Hatter tells his party guests to go attack the dynamic duo, and Batman and Robin start fighting all the members of Mad Hatter's wedding party. <coughs> Batman took down the last man to attack him, the man in the walrus costume. After knocking him out cold, his walrus helmet rolled on the ground, exposing the identity of the man who was beneath it. It was none other than Elaine's fiancé, Brian, with the red hypno band around his head. Batman quickly pulls it off his head and smashes it. And then Mad Hatter says, Dear, 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 Batman, you and your young friend really do know how to make a mess. And you ruined the wedding day of Alice as he was pointing to the tranced Elaine sitting in the chair next to him, dressed as Alice from Alice in Wonderland, and just staring into space like she was in a canatonic state. Uh, then Batman says to the Mad Hatter, This is what you want? Look at her. She's just a soulless robot, without thinking, without feeling, without any emotion. Then Mad Hatter gets up from his chair, and he says to Batman angrily, i rather have her as a soulless robot than lose her to another man. Then the Mad Hatter grabs a giant axe and charges at Batman. Robin looks on in suspense as the Mad Hatter was coming fast at Batman, but then Batman quickly reacted and with his left hand grabbed onto the axe before it was able to swing onto him, and then with his right fist he punched the Mad Hatter, sending him flying back onto the dinner table, breaking all the china on the table. After the Mad Hatter was taken care of, Batman goes and pulls the control band from the head of Elaine. She was back to her normal, and then she sees Batman and says, Oh my god, it's Batman! Where am I? Then she sees the unconscious Mad Hatter on the dinner table, and she sees everybody else that was just on the ground unconscious. But then she saw a very alleviating sight. She sees her fiancé, Brian, who had come to, and took off the silly walrus costume, and he comes right up to her. The two began to embrace tightly and kiss. Later, the police come and take away Mad Hatter. And the one who was making the arrest was none other than Harvey Bullock. As he was looking around, one of his officers comes up to him and says, Detective Bullock, sir, we figured out the identity of these people in the costumes. These were just average customers who came to buy hats from 
Tetch's hat shop, and they have no memory of anything else. All they remember is just waking up with aches and pains like they've been beat up badly. And the officer goes on to say, except for the guys that we found in the pig masks, they are just petty crooks, and they claim, too, that they don't have any recollections joining up with Tetch. Bullock then tells the officer, well, just arrest the guys in a pig mask and everybody else is free to go home. The officer says, yes sir, detective, and walks off. Later that night, the bat signal shines in the sky and the commissioner was talking to Batman and Robin and the commissioner says, well, Batman, we got another big break. It seems that Stickley's death was caused by the Mad Hatter, and the commissioner goes on to explain, we had help from Lucius Fox of Wayne Enterprises. He asked us to see the video of the murder of Stickley from a year ago in Wayne Enterprises, and with special software, he revealed that it was a CGI forgery. We got to see the actual murder being committed by none other than Jervis Tetch. And then Batman says to the commissioner, it's nice to solve two cases in one night. Gordon replies back to Batman, It is indeed. And then as he reaches to grab a cigarette out of his pocket, he looks back up and Batman and Robin were gone. And then the commissioner says aloud to himself, One of these days I'm going to put a cowbell on those two. Like and subscribe. The end.